what's important about that is individual counselors. So I have a license in mental health counseling, and I also have a license in family therapy. Uh, mental health counselors aren't really trained um, in sexuality specifically. Um, so even getting to the point with someone who's probably in a mental health counseling role of talking about sex would really be on the the onus oftentimes of the client to initiate that conversation because that's not an area of specialization for that field per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is hard. I just got done telling you that most people grow up in a sex silent society Mm -hmm. and so it's hard for them to initiate it. Mm -hmm. Um, Family therapists, marriage and family therapists, I don't like the name. It's kind of a misnomer. I wish it was Mm -hmm. just relationship therapists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they get some training out of pretty much all the helping professions, just standard. They, they get some training on sex therapy. They might have that be part of their intake process when people come see them. Um, so sometimes they'll initiate that. So I would say that oftentimes, (laughs) at least in couples, um, couples that I see, I would say at least in half to, to three quarters Well, two-thirds of those relationships, there are sexual issues going on as well as communication issues. And most family therapists aren't going to necessarily ask about that until they've already talked about the communication problems. And, you know, it's kind of which came first, chicken, egg, cart, horse, you know, did the communication problems come before the sexual issues or did the sexual issues come before the communication problems and how you work with those couples, really that question's important, but because a lot of family therapists aren't trained to think that way, they aren't even addressing the sexuality part. So the the field of sex therapy is important because when someone comes to us and that's already a credential that you have or an area of specialization, they don't feel like they're going to have to be sexually silent Hopefully they're not going to deal with sex negativity since the whole point is to be, you know, non-judgmental, positive regard. And they're probably not going to have to initiate it. The sex therapist will, that'll be part of the intake process. It'll be part of, you know, I understand you have communication problems. What percent of your problem do you think is communication, you know, outside of sexuality related issues? And what percent do you think is sexuality related? And so you'll really get to the heart of that. So I would say that 50 to, you know, two thirds of couples couples, not individuals, there are sexuality things going on for sure. Absolutely. Can I just throw really Mm -hmm. quick, because when I was still married and I'm divorced and he's now remarried with twins, God love him, wish him the best. Really, I truly do. But we tried to see a counselor before we got divorced. And I got to tell you, it was an unmitigated disaster. Yeah. Um, the guy was nothing sure. I'm sorry. He was an ass. Mm-hmm. We walked in there and he gives us the speech. Didn't ask us hardly any questions. And blah, 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 blah. And then before he even really got to anything, he turns around and he goes, oh, I, and he like 20 minutes into the session that we were charged the entire hour for said, I'm sorry, I have an issue with my son. I've got to leave. And we never went back. We're like, screw this. You yeah. know? And I mean, I just think people like that should be yeah. sanctioned. Yeah. Like he totally put us off of a possible opportunity right. to go, you know, and who I, I just think he would have sucked absolutely. anyway. Well, absolutely. And the thing of it is, is, is the majority of couples, by the time they go see someone for couples issues in many cases, I hate saying this, it doesn't sound hopeful. In many cases, it's, it's almost too late. Um, and in this case, that wasn't necessarily the situation. You had a therapist that, or a counselor that clearly was not focused on their work. <laughs> That's nicely put. And the, put. And the yeah. client and the client needs first, which really is mm-hmm. is that role. That's your role. I mean, it's not the same role as as being a teacher. It's not the same world. You know, I mean it's different. Your your clients are your world uh for that time period. But the majority of the couples that that come to our clinic um or that I've seen, you know, oftentimes it, it, it sadly it is too late. Um because you're looking at a system that's become so entrenched in their problems that it's hard for them to get outside of that. That doesn't mean that there aren't cases where it turns around and it goes really, really well. It doesn't mean there aren't times that people come just at the right time or come even before their problems. We we now have a good chunk of people that come, you know, to like pre-relational therapy, like before they move in together, they'll like go see a therapist and That's cool. uh, before they domestic partner or get married, they'll go see a therapist, you know. So, I mean, we do have a good chunk of people that are doing that. Um, but, you know, most people, they're so desperate by the time that they go get help that, you know, 
for a relationship that sometimes it's it's too late. And then you have therapists that counselors that sound like they don't know what they're really doing. Yeah, it sounds like if it got to that point too that one may want to be there and the other one isn't. And then so you've got to deal with that um, aspect That's, too yeah. because if you've got someone that doesn't if you're if you don't want to talk to the person that you're in a relationship with talking to a yeah. stranger must just freak f- folks, you know, one of the or two even out even more. Yeah. Um, and 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 to try and get the brain to go but this is a good step you've taken, but they're just it's right. so talking it's just so tough. Well, and, <laughs> for and, some folks, and I, I, I get that. I and, know, for, you know, there's just sometimes I'm like, I'm not in a talky mood, which is hard to believe, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, mm. but, but getting help is stigmatized, help yeah. of any kind, whether it's medical help, mental health help, relational help. I mean, oh, it, when, I, when it, I broke my ankle, I'm like, oh God, I don't really want to bother people. You know, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. And, <laughs> and it was just, you know, and it's really people, you right. know, or friends are going yeah. through chemo or this or that. Yeah. And you're like, I'll come over and do your laundry, you know, but yeah. they're just, it was tough for folks, and, you know, versus they, I'll be there. I, I realized I was, uh, for a few folks here, I just said, well, I'm going to do something specific. And then one, it didn't work out one time, another time it did. I said, right. I'm going to come over on Thursday and do your laundry. Right. And they're just like, Okay. Yeah. You know, but it was a very specific thing. And that's, I think that was better versus, you know, tell me if you need any help because, right. oh my God, getting even your that's closest, really e- smart of you. getting yeah. your closest friends to even yeah. say, I need this, or can you run and get right. groceries or I, right. I, I, it's just tough. Well, and, and there's a, there's layers to this, right? There's a gendered component. Um, you know, men mm-hmm. oftentimes are supposed to, men, whatever this means, cisgender men, mm-hmm. um, are oftentimes perceived as like having to be strong, whatever that means. So asking for help there is challenging. And then women, of course, have been stereotyped for constantly needing help emotionally. So, mm-hmm. so it's hard to ask for help that way too. And then when you add on, you know, and I love the title of your show, when you add on the fact that we're, you know, in... Minnesota and we're in, you know, the Midwest where people, you know, they want to be nice and they want to help each other. But at the same time, they're also really guarded in many ways. Um, And I think a lot of that's that Scandinavian German influence. Um, My dad's whole family is from Norway. So, I mean, I feel that. (laughs) So, so I think it also depends on, you know, the culture and the gender, but I agree with you. People, they have a hard time asking for help. And so coming to a therapist you know, to get when it's a dyadic couple, two people trying to get them both there is really, 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 really challenging. Maybe one person thinks you need help, the other person doesn't really think that the relationship needs help. So it's hard to get them in. Well, and God forbid if at the root of the issue, because yeah. I can say that one of our issues was we got into a situation where he was having, you know, dealing with ED and he was mm-hmm. really young for that. I mean, I don't know what, mm-hmm. what in, you know, the mm-hmm. clinical definition is, but it seemed very young. He was still in his thirties, mm-hmm. you know, early, you mm-hmm. know, mid thirties. And um, that's a bugger, man. I mean, that's not, and I, I can tell you right now, I love his parents parents dearly his father's mm-hmm. gone but his parents but I know that that stuff was not talked about and I knew that he had some right. weirdness his whole family did right. around sex because of there was something weird that went on and his mom came off as this very uptight and actually everybody else was afraid of her all the other daughters in law and whatever or, or you know whatever but I just decided that I wasn't she had a very large do not disturb sign in front of her we ended up becoming very good friends because I just refused to be anything other than who I was mm-hmm. and we had a riot together but I could see how something mm-hmm. funky I think it was in, infidelity in the house you mm-hmm. know whatever but that really made it through to the kids and this is after years of he and I t- you know doing the post more <laughs> on things and you know and now we're really good friends we're divorced and mm-hmm. we're actually we were really good friends when we were married we just mm-hmm. weren't a good couple right. you know what I mean yeah. but yeah it's weird how you figure that out and this is my completely unqualified opinion mm-hmm. and guesswork you mm-hmm. know and his too mm-hmm. you know yeah well the what I love about what you just observed is and this is where the family therapy part is so helpful and sex therapists don't get this training so this is where these two fields actually complement each other. Family therapists are highly concerned with family legacy um, around all sorts of issues, communication issues, uh, out of control behaviors, um, sexuality concerns. So I think what you're noticing is exactly that. What was the family legacy that was passed on and how did that influence you know, your former partner for himself in his current relationship, past relationship? 
sex therapists spend less time doing the intergenerational transmission of sexuality related stuff because that's not really what they're trained to do. Whereas family therapists are trained to look at that stuff. Mm, okay. So that's where I think, you know, when I, I do what are called sex speak sessions now, which, which are not therapy and they're not teaching. Um, what they are is, um, my colleague Francisco Ramiro is out of New York City a couple of years ago who a, a, has a master's in public health and deeply cares about sexuality, and that's his primary area of focus. What he started doing was just setting up a sign that said free sex advice. <laughs> <laughs> like Lucy and the Peanuts? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So she so, charged yeah. five cents. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> and so he did this for um, you know a number of years, and it was really successful. And I was thinking to myself, you know, we should – be doing that. So we started doing that like six months ago now. We've we've had one here in Minneapolis. We've held some in, in Menominee where Stout is. And what we do is we just set up a sign and then people can ask any question. Um, and what you find is is really this intergenerational like sexual silence. The main thing that people struggle with is just not being able to talk about sex. And this is, of course, convoluted with the fact that now it's all over our technology. So, I mean, <laughs> it might be, like, highly engaged with watching sex. Sex or sexting or talking, but, but actual communicating about yeah, it. Yeah, they have no idea. And they have very little knowledge because the stuff they access on the internet, you know, oftentimes isn't rooted in anything oh, no. research-based. We, yeah, we spent a lot of time talking about how it it is a fantasy out there. You're looking at stuff that isn't real. I mean, you don't think Star Wars is real or you don't think that Jack so Reacher's accurate. real, all that sort of stuff. These are fantasy worlds. They are. And so is the, the adult film industry. That's there, right. You know, there's, a few, there's a few things out there where, where someone, um, you know, stuffs a, a camera in their bedroom, but even then they're playing yeah, to the camera. It's performance, performance camera. art. It's just a performance yeah. art. Yeah. I mean, it's not. It's not real. Yeah. I, I tell my students this all the time. I'm like. That is like when you watch an action movie and people do stunts and mm. that's like not real, like mm. people are paid to do that and not even the real actor does those stunts mm. usually. I'm like, that's what adult film is. It's, it's, it's not real. It, it is. Mm. It's a fantasy. And, and you know, they, they have people that come in and do certain parts that they're not going to do. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, yeah, but you're right. And people think that's real. And they have no one to really check in with about the reality. And and that's that creates all sorts of issues. They can't go to their parents. They, no, no. They don't have I mean, comprehensive sex education hardly anywhere. So I mean, Yeah, I'm in business with my parents, but we never had the talk. I've mentioned this before. It's hysterical. But I could see from my parents, my mom, my, uh, Mom being a nurse and my dad, you know, he didn't, he, it, it never occurred to him for somehow, for some reason, and I could see that by the way he treated people, that who people slept with is none of his business and he didn't care. But it wasn't anything that was ever said. It was judging by merchandise that he bought, people mm-hmm. that he hired, mm-hmm. stuff was going through there. And so I could see it in actions, mm-hmm. even though I, I'm pretty sure my dad never said, I don't give a crap who he's sleeping with. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, but it was actions by the folks that were hired and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And it was just always funny because I'm like, these are two very, you know, conservative people. There was never a talk ever. It was hilarious. Right. But we end up selling sex toys for a living. That's it's just, amazing. Because it's Isn't business. that great? I love <laughs> I their love story. That. I know. <laughs> and it's just, it just sort of cracks me up. Yeah. But what I have learned from that, and I think things get better, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm you know, I, I cannot talk for my brother or sister, but I know darned well that... My kid from day one, that nothing was ever called a JJ, right, or a PP, right, or you know, I mean, just right, it's just you got a question, I'm going to answer it, and yeah. I've even told her friends that. I mean, the other day I was, I mean, I, I had surgery and because I was peeing in my pants and I got an infection, <laughs> it and they're like uninhibited, yeah, yeah, I like and that. they're yeah. like. Uh, how can we feeling like crap? I said, well, because I have a urinary tract infection because <sighs> I was peeing in my pants, and the one, yeah. the one guy went. Oh, you just sort of like say the truth, don't you? And my and my daughter just looked at <laughs> just looked at her friends and said, "Yeah, that's how she is." And it wasn't it wasn't embarrassment, right. it wasn't anything. It just said if you ask me a question, right. You're going to get an answer. Right. I mean, if if it's not, you know, it could, yeah, not everything. Mm-hmm. Some things are private, that's fine. Everyone's mm-hmm. allowed to have a mm-hmm. private life, but that's like no, that's mm-hmm. what this is mm-hmm. why I feel like hell. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm at the house. And, yeah. You know, well, it was, yes, these were 15 and 16 year old yeah. kids, but they deserve to know. I mean, right. maybe one of these 20 or 30 years from now, maybe one of them's peeing in their damn pants. And now they know that they can go to the doctor and have it taken care of. Right. Well, and it's mm-hmm. funny because, I mean, I love that you're so open with um, mm-hmm. your daughter because like my mom, 